our timing. Judges? Good morning. <clears throat> How is everybody? Good. Glad to see you. My name is Rita McCannon. I'm an attorney in Huntsville, Alabama. And I'm Hank Chambers. I'm a law professor down at the University of Richmond. Hi, I'm Thomas Mackey at the University of Louisville History Department in the Brandeis School of Law. Tell us who you are. Good morning. We're Unit 3 from Staples High School in Westport, Connecticut. My name is Tadeo Messenger. These are my teammates, Brett Levy, Kashvi Kumar, and Rachel Suggs. And this is our wonderful teacher, Mrs. Cameraman. Uh, we thank you for your time this morning, and we are ready to begin whenever you guys are. We appreciate so much the preparation and the hard work you all have done. I'm going to read question three, as I'm sure you're prepared for, and then we'll begin. In 2020, we celebrate the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which recognized the right of women to vote. Despite recent controversy, the Equal Rights Amendment has not yet been declared ratified. What are the similarities and differences between these two amendments? What impact, if any, has the 19th Amendment had on women in achieving equality with men in the United States and around the world? What are the advantages and disadvantages of states passing their own equal rights amendments rather than ratifying a national constitutional amendment? And you may begin. In 1918, women's equality was significantly bolstered by the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote. After its ratification, candidates directly catered to the ideals of women, and Congress addressed women-centered issues such as the funding of family planning services. According to a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research, child mortality dropped by 15%, and local education expenditures increased by 9%. Although 15 states allowed women to vote before the amendment, most extended only partial suffrage, such as presidential and primary voting. But the 19th Amendment put America on par with 15 other developed countries that enfranchised women before the U.S. The research agency DB5 found that 80% of Americans believe that women and men are legally equal on all counts in the Constitution, but the 19th Amendment only grants women the right to vote. It doesn't give women equal rights, only a political voice. The Equal Rights Amendment, first introduced by activist Alice Paul in 1923, would guarantee the constitutional rights may not be denied on account of sex. In 1972, the ERA passed both houses of Congress but failed state ratification for Congress's imposed seven-year deadline. Although Virginia became the 38th state necessary to ratify, the last January, the Justice Department declared that its resolution expired in 1982 and is no longer pending before the states. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg acknowledged that the ERA needs to restart the entire ratification process. The legal impact of the ERA would be monumental. First, it would require courts to apply the highest level of scrutiny, as opposed to intermediate scrutiny currently used today when analyzing gender-based government actions. This distinction would elevate gender to a suspect classification akin to race or ethnicity. It wasn't until the 1971 case, Reed v. Reed, that the court acknowledged the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment to apply to government actions towards women, but they did not establish a standard of scrutiny. In 1976, Craig v. Warren established that sex discrimination would be interpreted under intermediate scrutiny. U.S. v. Virginia adhered to this precedent in 1996 when the court ruled public education institutions cannot discriminate by sex and that any gender-based government action must demonstrate an exceedingly persuasive justification. The ERA would thus ensure that discriminatory government actions serve a compelling state interest in order to be upheld as constitutional. Second, despite the statutory progress women have gained, namely through the Equal Pay Act, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and Title VII and IX of the Civil Rights Act, sex discrimination still persists and past progress can be reversed. In a 2011 interview, Justice Scalia even stated that he does not believe the Constitution prohibits sex discrimination. Today, a conservative Supreme Court comprised of twice as many men as women could set new precedents for women-centered issues such as abortion. The ERA would help prevent the rollback of rights women have gained. Finally, a constitutional amendment would ensure consistency among all states as 25 have enacted their own ERAs. For instance, California only specifies equal protection regarding employment and education, 
while Louisiana only prohibits sex discrimination that is deemed arbitrary or unreasonable. While states may be better equipped to address the needs of their populace, and state ERAs are the only realistic guides to possible interpretations of a federal amendment, only a federal amendment can provide unanimous legal pr protection against sex discrimination and ensure a consistent approach to regulating government action. The ERA is necessary to make all citizens equal in the eyes of the law, and Americans already support it. A 2016 poll by the Center for Public Affairs found that three in four Americans support a constitutional amendment to guarantee equal rights for men and women. Ratifying the ERA will constitutionally affirm the bedrock principle of our democracy, that all individuals have equal justice under law. Thank you for your time. We're now ready for questioning. Thank you all so much. A uh, question for you. Uh, it sounds like you believe that pro-women legislation would be constitutional under the ERA. It, is that the case? Would pro-women legislation be constitutional under the Equal Rights Amendment? Yes, it would. Um, and there's, there's a controversy going on right now that, that anti-ERA activists don't want women's privileges to be diminished, and that's one of the reasons why feminists don't want the ERA. However, it's important to note that raising gender-based government actions to strict scrutiny doesn't mean that all of these statutes are going to get struck down, like alimony checks to single mothers. It just means that they're going to need to prove a compelling governmental objective, kind of like how race is considered under strict scrutiny, but affirmative action is still constitutional because the court had decided that diversity in higher education is a compelling state interest. So, so is it fair to say the ERA would make pro-women legislation more likely to be deemed unconstitutional than less likely to be deemed constitu constitutional because of the strict scrutiny that would be applied? Yeah, would it be equal? Yes, it would be equal. Okay, okay. Now, the, if I understand correctly, that the proposed ERA and the 19th Amendment deal with sex, but you seem to use, the group seems to use sex and gender interchangeably. Help me understand that relationship, if any, and how do you perceive that? Does that make a difference? There is a difference. Um, there is a difference between gender and sex because sex implies the two biological sexes, male and female, whereas the term gender has been somewhat controversial since gender would include all forms of gender identity, meaning that passing an ERA with the word gender in it would include all those who are transsexual and don't identify with either male or female. But the ERA uses the word sex, which only implies that men and women would not be treated on different grounds. Yeah, well, that then gets back to my the earlier question by my colleague is, therefore, if you can't treat men and women differently, would pro-women legislation then be unconstitutional under the ERA? Only if there was no uh, compelling uh, government interest involved. Uh, if there is a compelling government interest involved, then it would still be allowed to take place and still be in place. In the same way that we use affirmative action to even out the discrimination that people of color have been facing for centuries upon centuries, we could use some pro-women legislation to even out the type of discrimination and the prejudice in this country that women face. And back to the question about the gender identity, that there is a pushback that by having the ERA would further codify into law the notion that there are only two genders, which a lot of advocates don't want. However, there are two cases right now pending before the Supreme Court. Um, for example, Altitude Incorporated versus Zarda, and the Supreme Court is right now determining whether or not gender identities would be included in the ERA. If it were ever to be reactivated or restarted, as, as Justice Ginsburg has said, do you think that uh, separating or defining gender or sex would have some uh, influence over whether states would would uh, ratify it or not? I do think that would have a big difference. However, um, discrimination on the basis of sexuality has not been treated by courts as a form of sex-based discrimination. Uh, many federal and state laws have rapidly evolved over the past several decades, and I would assume that other states with the addition of gender into that ERA 
would have a different take on it. Um, there are some cases, namely Bostock v. Clayton County pending before the Supreme Court today, and then we will know definitively whether sexual identity is considered under the umbrella of sex discrimination. But on the other hand, after the Civil War, the NWSA discouraged, not discouraged, but disassociated themselves from women of color and said that a 19th Amendment would not apply to them. And after the 19th Amendment was passed, women of color had to wait another 40 years before they were given the right to vote. If women in today's date were to exclude people of trans, of a separate gender that is not male or female, then they may have to wait an extended amount of time before they're guaranteed those same rights. And it's important to note that the women's liberation movement is not monolithic. Like I went to the Women's March on Washington in 2017 and there were counter protesters there who were feminists and didn't believe that the march was advocating for the women's liberation movement. So there are always going to be ideological divisions within any social movement. So, so, so help me out. If the 15th Amendment says that folks can't discriminate on the basis of race in voting and the 19th says that people can't discriminate on the basis of sex, then how could black women not have had the right to vote after the 19th Amendment? Well, um, I think it was Senator Joseph Randall from Louisiana who said, if the 19th Amendment were to be uh, ratified, that legislatures, legislators in the South would do the same thing they did with um, male African Americans who were enfranchised after the um, Civil War Amendment. They would just institute Jim Crow laws um, so that they would restrict um, female African Americans from voting. Okay, okay. Thank y'all. Hey, yeah. Oh my gosh, I think we could have kept chatting for another 10 or 15 minutes if Mr. Lanier had not so rudely stuck that stop sign up there. But um, I thank you so much. What an interesting discussion. Um, judges, would you like to follow up? Yeah, I, I thought it was a good good discussion on a tough question. Uh, it gets, you, you know, we, we, we gave y'all a very hard question in terms of what the what the the ERA would do. And you all noted, hey, you can have pro pro women legislation as long as it meets strict scrutiny. What's interesting and what's tough is that is correct. But what that means is that the ERA would make it more difficult to have pro women legislation. And maybe that's fine, right? but it's right. a but it's a tough piece of the piece of the puzzle. And I thought y'all handled it well. So y'all did a good job with some really tough questions. And we only ask tough questions of groups who have shown themselves able to handle them. Uh, so take that as a compliment. But good work. Yeah. No, agree. We we deliberately can judge and throw out the hardballs. And you guys did a nice job on this one. Uh, look on on its face, it doesn't look that difficult question, but you add in constitutional structure, legal principles, and then the larger cultural norms dealing with men and women and the variations. And this turns out to be not such an easy question after all. So I thought you guys did a really nice job of negotiating your way through the case law and the statutes, but also thinking hard about the public policies uh, that have, have shaped us and, and we confront today. So uh, well done indeed. Thank you all. I know your teacher's proud of you.